Hey guys, what's going on? It's your favorite NRL fantasy fanatic, Spot the Aussie here for round number three analysis. Looking back from round number two, how do we go? We went a little bit astray, 668 points, which wasn't woefully bad, but it was actually pretty bad. It was below the average for the round, however, because we did so well in round number one, we're still ranked 575th, so that puts us still in the top 1% of all the fantasy coaches out there and there is approximately 82,000 of you out there now so it's quite significantly grown over the last week I think by at least six to five thousand but guys we have so many questions to get through because all you guys have been sending in various things from various different platforms whether it be through Facebook or a forum that I'm on and you know what I actually might do a video next week about social media and you so you know where I'm doing my things to look at teamless Tuesdays to bounce opinions off people to get a mutual understanding of how people are looking and what their trains of thoughts are and it's actually a really good way of kind of you know making sure that your team is molded as best as it possibly could because you have one train of thought and if you mix it with many other people out there then you can possibly bounce a much better idea. And sometimes they're completely left field ideas that you don't think about until someone actually mentions it to you. And then you go, well, that might not be that good of a deal. Maybe I'll go with what person X said. But again, everything comes down to yourself and your personal opinions and thoughts when you're making your trades. Like for example, before this round kicked off, I had Bryce Cartwright coming in at half and I put out a question on one of the Facebook groups I follow. And I said, guys, I'm thinking about trading him in or out for... Adam Reynolds coming in late minute for his appendix issue that he had for the Rabbitohs and he played absolutely amazing. Reynolds ended up getting 60 points. The question I asked was talk me out of it, talk me into it. Every single person talked me out of doing the trade. They said, look, Bryce Cup, Cartwright had a very average first round. He'll bounce back. He's definitely going to play because we thought he might not have played due to the issue of, you know, the whole social media blow up with the abortion and so forth. But there were also other ideas about, you know, Adam Reynolds does get injured quite a lot, you know, and it's no point having a top 17 player in your team if they're not going to be playing. Also to mention that his buy coverage is really poor. Rabbitohs play, if you compare Sammy Burgess right there, uh, well, Rabbitohs play in round 12 and also the 15th round buy, I think from memory, which means that if I had Adam Reynolds who plays State of Origin, he misses five rounds between that, you know, buy coverage period and that's actually not really that great so I decided to stick with it and it was once confirmed on um, on Twitter that Bryce Conroy was definitely playing I thought okay that's great he ended up getting picking up an injury there was a worry that it was going to be his ankle plate it didn't end up being his ankle plate it was really unfortunate you know something that you couldn't really see but at the end of the day the, the train of thought was correct the train of thought to keeping in my squad was actually correct that the hindsight went against us with him getting injured obviously went against us in the long run which kind of sucked and there was obviously other players that got affected Jared Hayne getting injured Rog Roger Tulvasashek getting a concussion and that would that would affect him more than 50% whereas Bryce Cartwright was you know the 20% so in hindsight yes he did lose 41k quite significantly if Bryce Cartwright plays this week which it looks like he is going to I would have definitely of um, held on to him regardless because I still think he's a top 17 gun. It's just the fact that he's had a bit of a flop and it might be a bit of a pickup for other coaches to contend with. But I have so many questions from you guys. There's so many things to get through. And one thing I want to ask you guys is please give this video a like on the YouTube platform and please subscribe to my page. I actually have 1.5k subscribers now. That was the first time I've actually hit it in the last week. Thank you so much for all the support, all the comments, all the likes, all the appreciation. I'm happy to keep having my team an open forum and asking you, uh, answering your questions that you've got here. I've got some really, really good ones. I had a lot of repetitive ones that I've gone with whatever the first person did. Obviously, the big ones at the moment are what do we do with all these cashies because they're coming out left, right, and center. There's Ponga, Tyler Cornish, Carl Lawton, Robert Jennings, Abby Montoya, Slater, Tyron Roberts, Davis, Braden Burns, Dylan Edwards, jo Joseph Manu, and Ioana, who might not con still be considered a cashie, but was a cashy so so many things to consider but before we get into it i want to talk about something that's going to be like the theme of this video like we did last video last video was trading out guns for guns and how it's not that great of a deal to be considering it let's have a look at chasing points people love to chase one week of results they see someone do a considerably high job you know they get a couple of tries they score much higher than what they usually would 
from the prior data that we have of last year, nothing else has really changed. Just the fact that they played amazing in one game and people start to chase points. And the most traded out players, the most traded in players is where we're gonna be able to see that evidence. Now, one of the most traded players was Luke Curie. Luke Curie in the halves. He scored like 72. And then this week he ended up scoring 33, which goes back down to his average. And a lot of people got caught out by that. On the flip side of that is one of the most traded out players in week one, which is the data we're looking at, was Tommy Trevojevic. Tommy scored, you know, 30, 27 points, whatever it was, 27 points. Comes out and gets 81 and therefore puts himself back into the top 17 players on the fantasy league at the moment. So Dean Ware was another one. He scored 10 this week, ended up going back in round two and scoring 52, which is one of the highest scoring centers for that round. James Tamo, people had washed him out and then he ended up coming back and scoring 52 points. So people were obviously chasing scores and that's probably one of the weakest habits you want to get rid of as a fantasy coach because it's very easy to get sucked into something like that and say, well, okay, this player, Cameron McInnes scored, you know, 71-71 in the last round. Is he going to score that the next time? What are the facts? That's the one thing that you always have to ask yourself is what are the facts behind those trades? But as you can see in the last week's trades, that's what happened. What are we looking at this week? The most traded in player is Cohen Hess, Robert Jennings, Dylan Edwards. Over 1,000 coaches have traded him in. He played really well. Ended up getting 52 points. Went up 28K. Has a BE of a break even of a negative score, I imagine, which means he's going to go up in value. He's got this game to play. On the extended bench, however, Hiku's been named. So is DWZ who could easily replace him just before kickoff, or at least in the next round. And that was one of the questions I actually received from Milk Chow, which was, how many games would you want from your cashies to make them worthwhile? Now, the rule of thumb is the price of your player is based on the last five games that they've played. So let's say, for example, you get a basement player for 138000 which is the rookie price of 138k and the break even is 15. So if they if they go on the next 15 game or the next 5 games and they score 15 15 15 15 15 they're going to be 138k which means they don't go up in value. But if they score 50 and 50 and 15 50, 50 they're going to go exponentially up all the way up to 400 and you know 50,000 whatever the 50 mark is using that as an example. So the reality is, if you want to do that as a bit of a basis, I would say that if you want a player to see the actual, to make a worthwhile trade, is at least three games is good, four games is great, five games is hitting the peak, and you could probably trade just before that fifth game. So just after the fourth game, you'd want to be able to do it. There are other players who might play one round, do an absolute amazing job, like Talakai. Look at this, Talakai played he got 44 points and gets benched the next game went up 20k has a b of three if he scored 44 again he'd go up by more than 20k because it goes exponentially he'd probably go up by 30k so the fact is he played one game and that was an unknown thing like you thought he was going to play more but ended up getting benched last minute for robert jennings on, a, a, on his defensive habits which was really surprising given the fact how heimel hunt's been playing but the other player that everyone wants to talk about at the moment is Kalen Ponga. And it was confirmed in a tweet that Lachlan Coote's only going to be out for about one to two weeks. Which tells me that unless Lachlan Coote's going to come in down the track, maybe in five or six rounds after he goes out after two rounds, it's not worth it. There are better cashies to have. Now, the other thing you have to consider is the circumstances. Do you have to bring in Kalen Ponga to play as you're 17, because you want to be able to score points as much as you possibly can while having the best team on the park and also getting the most amount of cash. So the most common contrast I can use right now is looking at Kalen Ponga and then looking at the likes of a Brad Abbey, who's been named fullback for the Canterbury Bulldogs. So Brad Abbey's gone to fullback for William Hopawati, who's out for at least four to six weeks. But not only is Will Hopawati out for four to six weeks, he's out with four to six weeks plus he's not going to play Sundays. So we know we're going to get four to five games minimum from Brad Abbey. At least in the first 10 rounds, we're going to get four to five games minimum. 
The benefit there, the additional site up plus that we might also see, is the fact that Abbey, well, the Canterbury Bulldogs, also play on that round 12, which is one of the main buy rounds, I believe. Yes, it is. So the Bulldogs play on round 12. As you can see, that's really good for buy coverage if Woolhopper Whitey gets the call up to State of Origin, which he might. I mean, he got called up last time. There's a good case that he might get called up again. Debatable. A lot of people say, well, maybe, you know, he won't because there's like better players than him. Yeah, that was, that was the same case as the last series that we had. But for Abbey, we're going to see him play at least four to five games. So if Abby's going to be able to score 30 points cons consistently, he'll go up to about 300,000 from his 138, and we'll see that potential hit. Whereas if Ponga only played one game, ends up getting 30 to 40. And we know how good Ponga is. Off the ground right now, you would say that Ponga is the best cashy out there at the moment to have, purely based on how many fantasy points he's going to score. But what's the point of having him in for one game, two games, and then having to trade him out straight away, that's going to put your team under a lot of stress. That's going to put my team under a lot of stress. Look what I have at the moment. Reverse the trades, I'd have Hain over here, Idris, which was very concerning for my sensors and wingers because I, I'm running out of players to play. I'm literally running out of players. So Kalen Ponga at the moment, I'm actually going to reverse that trade and I'll reverse it for you guys right now so you can actually see what I'm going to be doing with my team is actually going to be a no-go. So who are the cashies to have? Who are the guys I'm considering at the moment? Let's talk about that first. Kalen Ponga at the moment is a no for me based on the tweet that we got from the Fox Sports gentleman, purely because of the one to two rounds. If you've held on to him pre-round one, I mean, keep holding on to him. I can't make a trade for him. I can't justify making a trade for him. Tyler Corner is coming in for fullback for Jared Hayne. That might be short-lived. You don't know how long that's actually going to hold up. William Zillman could go back to fullback. They could push, you know, someone else out onto the wing. There seems to be a lot of injuries in that back line at the moment, and there's a lot of question marks. I don't like Tyler Cornish for the, for the fact that he's so far back into that team that he could be plucked the next week. We also don't know what to expect from him. Yes, he does kick about 66% of the conversions in the NYC Cup, so he's actually quite the converter, but we know Ash Taylor is going to be converting, so he's not going to get the benefit of doing the kicks that he would usually do in the lower grade. And for that reason, I don't think he's a goer for me. The other player that I seriously am going to consider and is going to be my trade, and if you're watching this video and you don't make this trade and you've got a fullback and an injured player like a Python to trade and you're not going to do it, then that's a big mistake in my opinion, is of course Tyrone Roberts Davis. And the reason why I'm saying Tyrone Roberts Davis is a must is because if we can pull him up, Tyrone Roberts Davis played in the last game. What do you notice about that? He scored 37 points. He has a break even of negative three and his value is 138,000. For whatever reason, they didn't add Tyron Roberts Davis before he played. He was named on the uh, extended bench and then, get caught, and then got caught up in the last minute. He was actually named the 21st man. So he got caught up in the last minute and actually played. And what the fantasy guys have said at this stage is what we know is because we didn't add him, we're actually going to add him as a rookie basement price at 138000 But what we're also going to do is, is um, carry over the last game's results. So he scored 37 points and therefore his break-even is negative three, which tells us that he has the benefit that we've never seen before of being a cashy who's already played one of the four to five games that we want our cashies to play in order to hit their full potential. What's the whole idea of having a cashy? Cashies, you're probably not going to be naming in your top 20, in, in your top 17. You're going to have them on your extended bench, purely making cash. He's one step closer than any other cashier at the moment at basement price. If he gets another 37, he's going to be going up by 50, 60K. That's how much of an input that's going to have because it's going to, it's going to re-trigger it and try to pull up its value exponentially up as if he was a 37-point player. That's how it works. So I'm going to be pulling him up. Does that mean that he's going to be scoring 37 consistently? No, he ended up scoring a try through a very, very, very good um, decoy move by Tyrone Roberts on the wing. He's probably good for 20 or so points, but the main thing is he is one step ahead of all the other cashies. So I strongly believe, and I strongly suggest, 
if you're looking at pulling someone in, at least look at pulling in Tyron Roberts Davis ahead of any of the any of the other cashies. It looks like he has the spot and it's his to lose at the moment and he's not at risk. I mean, Ty, Tyler Cornish, as we just talked about, is the first person in the firing line. Now, the second point of that is, is your cashies playing? Because if they're not playing, that means you need to be trading them out, in my opinion. Other people I've seen on the forum surprisingly have said that I have no reason to trade out my cashies like a Dylan Python if I'm going to be trading into another mud cashie. Sometimes you have to take that risk in order to make yourself money. With my strategy, because I have guns and cashies, how can I get other cashies into guns if none of them are playing? And the reality is they have to be playing. They have to be making as much money together in order to make one of them go from a cashy into a gun. I'm not saying a cashy is going to become a gun. I'm saying that if two cashies go to mid-level, you can sell one and then drag that other one by trading that mid-level up to a gun. In fact, that's what I'm going to be doing soon enough around the three to four mark. So most of my trades aren't really happening now that I'm looking to hit my potential of my players. Most of my trades are happening because people simply aren't playing. Jared Hayne is out for five rounds, six rounds, four rounds as a cash in my team with the potential to be a gun. Reality is we don't know how good he is going to be this season. First game, went to the wing. We thought in round two he was going to be, have a bit of a wind-up game with all the media being on his back, but there's also talk about him potentially being a state of origin contender, which tells us that that's not going to be that great of a deal for him. Again, cutting into his buy you know, coverage and really sinking us out between those major games that we need. So that's not a consideration. Talakai, again, is circumstantial because he's been named as the 18th man. He might not get to play this week, and it doesn't look like he is. But all it takes is one injury or one player not to be playing up to scratch like a Heimel Hunt, and all of a sudden Talakai is going to be coming in. I just think with the amount of upside Talakai has with a B of three, he's worth holding on to. Whereas a Hayne I know is injured to four to five, six rounds. And I just want to make money. I just want to make money as fast as I possibly can while trying not to waste trades at the same time. Idris named on not even the extended bench in the top 21 men for the Tigers, which means he's not even going to be a late consideration. It looks like he's been plucked for good which tells us that he's not going to be that great of a deal for us. So I've made a bit of a deal breaker where I've brought up Nick Kotrick, who I think is going to be scoring a lot higher as well because Jared Croker is back. He's back much earlier than we thought. And Kotrick's going to be outside Croker. And Croker is known to set up his outside man. Like, uh, remember when uh, Edric Lee was playing outside him, he dropped a lot of balls and so forth. So I think Kotrick's going to be the beneficial of that. And I'd expect Kotrick to get as best of a result from Jared Croker than what he has in the first two games. So we might even see Kotrick go up to 35 in the next game, if not 40. With Sully, again, you know, we're holding on to him. Sully, a case of he scored, you know, 50-plus against Greg Inglis, who was wobbling on one leg and now scoring 28. And that's going to be more of the exception scoring those bigger scores in his position on the wing. So expect those 28s and 30s, but he's going to be making some cash. Roger Tulvasashek is also one of the most traded out players for this round. I have absolutely no idea why. He scores plus 50 in the first round, gets concussed in the second round, and all of a sudden people go absolutely batshit insane and want to get rid of him. So obviously I'm going to be holding on to him, but it's it's really circumstantial. I believe not to hold many players, and sometimes you've got to take a risk. I traded him Braden Burns with the thought that he was going to do well. He ends up scoring 10. He was outside Heimel Hunt. Heimel Hunt had about four opportunities to spread the ball, one more man, and Burns would have been in the clear, but for whatever reason, he just wanted to hold the ball, take the tackle himself, and just not work in his favor. So my two trades this week are because people aren't going to be playing for a number of considerable rounds, if not the foreseeable future. So that's where my two trades are going. And that's where you should be going because you shouldn't really be making trades at the moment for players in the first two rounds based on of anything other than injury, in my opinion. And there were other questions like, uh, question five from Random was, underperforming guns like Sam Burgess, Paul Gallon, and, and Trent Merrin, what do we do there? I have Sam Burgess, and I spoke about this in the last video. He ends up scoring, you know, 48. His season rank of overall in fantasy is 31st. He's only six people off from being in the top 25, and therefore he's only, you know, another 14 people off being in the top 17 players. We know he's got great buy coverage. I'm holding him. Never trade a gun. Unless something has changed 
something has dramatically changed in that team. Like if he's changed teams or the rotation's been adjusted or he's not playing as many minutes, expect Sammy Burgess to actually be able to bounce back and get those higher scores because that's what they're there for. And they're making points. They're not just getting that in line. So I'm saying to people, hold on to the guns because we've seen in the last two rounds, as I point out, most traded out person has become you know one of the highest scorers of the round. Now, if you really were looking at trades, people have talked about pulling in Cohen Hess. Now, I could talk about Cohen Hess in quite detail, but Adrian Buttery of the Fantasy Lounge has actually made a very, very detailed post about Cohen Hess to the nth degree. And I feel like if someone has already done a fantastic job at explaining why they believe that that's a good option to be considering or a bad option to be considering, why reinvent the wheel when someone's already done it and actually just give that person credit? So Adrian Buttery, that was a really well wrap up of that player. I actually agree with pretty much everything you had to say there. The thing with Cohen Hess is he came on last round purely because there was an injury and he played extended minutes. It's kind of like Jared Wallace again. Wallace and Hess are very similar at the moment because Wallace again, if you remember in the first half for the Titans, he scored 18 points. And then all of a sudden, it looked like he wasn't going to be exceeding that because he was starting on the bench for the second half. But what ended up happening was because of all the injuries, the um, Titans only had 14 people. So they needed to bring on Wallace to play those extended minutes, much like he did in the first round. So Cohen S will definitely meet his BE of negative three. All he has to do is take the field and you know score zero points. He doesn't even have to take the field. He can score zero and still go up points. I mean, not points, but in dollar value. So I actually think Cohen S, based on all the information Buttery has, which I've kind of confirmed my own stats kind of look at, is that he's probably going to be worth around the 320k mark in the long run. Now you can trade him in. He can probably make another 60 to 70k, pending upon those really high scores. If he can, if he can keep scoring 40s and 50s without tries, he will go up by about 60. But I expect him to come back down. So you've got to ask yourself: Is it really worth making the trade? And for me, it's absolutely not. Every single person is doing their job. The guns are doing a pretty job. Good job. James Graham has lost 16k, but he's got 50 and 50. He's 24th ranked. Burgess has done a great job. Josh McGuire has done it. kafusi has gotten up there. One of the questions I was asked was um, underperforming cash cows like Elgi, Idris, and Winnerstein. Let's talk about Winnerstein and then Elgi. Winnerstein, pretty disappointing. He had zero attacking stats last game, and he had 22 tackles and about one missed tackle, and then he gained 20 meters just through running, which got him to his score of about 22 points. Well, it was 22 points after he got 31 the week before. So I'm not going to trade him yet. Remember what I said is you want these guys to play three to four games in order to hit their peak value. And look at him at the moment. Round three, B, break even, is again 13. So he's still got money to make. Not that much money. He might make another 8K. He might make another 10K in the next round. But I think 22 is going to be the lowest point score he's going to be able to get. So after round three, I'll reevaluate what he does again. He might score another 20, which means he only goes up 7K. And then his round three break even might be 20. And therefore, I'm going to consider trading him because he's hit his peak. But at the moment, I can't see him scoring lower than 22. I can see him scoring higher than the 13. And that's how I've set my team up. I've set my team up with the mindset of continuing Excuse me. I've, I've set my team up with the mindset of guys who are probably going to be hitting their stock after rounds three and four. And that's how the algorithm works. Kane Elgi is another one. Round three break even. 19. He's averaging... What is he averaging? 23.5. Low score 21, 26. He has a little bit of money to make. But because of my adjustments to the center and wing fullback position, I don't have any reason to trade Kane Elgi out. I'm going to be holding on to Elgi. In fact, I'm going to be playing Elgi because Corey Norman has been named out of the team last minute, which kind of caught a lot of people off guard. So uh, having a bit of a hamstring tweak to his uh, leg, and he might be out for one round by the looks of things. Riley Jacks hasn't been named, which meant that Billy Slater has come in. Riley Jacks, we said this last week, and again this week, did anyone see how he scored his points? I think it was like 32 tackles and zero missed tackles, or maybe like one missed tackle and all of that, which again 
is considerably high for a half because halves generally score 17 points max, well, average, I should say, last year. And um, he's been able to go back-to-back games and get 32 tackles. One was a missed tackle. He got 30 run meters and 32 kick meters. So that tells us that Cooper Cronk's the main kicker, as you can see. Where is Cooper Cronk? There he is, 300 and 438 meters he kicked. So Riley Jacks has zero attacking stats. Does this mean that when it starts, when it doesn't rain, they're in dry weather, will he score higher? Potentially, it just means he won't be as solid as a half because he's not going to have the tackles. And that's the only thing pulling him up. Yes, he might be able to get the... Um, he might be able to do a lot more with the, the attack, but defensively, he loses all those base stats. And I'm a base stat type of guy. That's why I've got Bryce Cartwright playing in my halves because I think they're more consistent. They average... Uh, that their averages are way more consistent to begin with. So that's where I'm going with that. Kenny Bromwich not getting the minutes or scores to be making much cash off him at the moment. Now, Kenny Bromwich, you had two ways to go with your Melbourne centers, Melbourne second rows, Kenny Bromwich and also Kafusi. I have to type this in. He's not making any money. He's a mid-ranger. I don't believe in mid-rangers, period. I have zero mid-rangers, there's 10% ownership. That's quite a significant amount of people. You know, Kafusi's just the main man to go. So if you're going to be looking at trading in a second row forward, Kafusi's probably the best bet at the moment because he's just so... He's just doing so well. Break even at three, 28% ownership. Join the boat. The boat usually sails at about that round three mark because only round four and five, you have money to make, if anything... So that's why I'm not looking to make any trades at the middle at the moment. Frank Winnerstein is, of course, my worst case scenario where, you know, he's still only going to make a little bit of money. Kane Elgi again, is just there. I'm just thin in the halves. And I can't justify paying more money to upgrade a half just to sit him on the bench. Once Corey Norman comes on, Elgi goes off. So Elgi might actually do a little bit better considering they're playing the um, Newcastle Knights, although Newcastle Knights did play pretty well. One thing I'm going to change this week is my captaincy. So Cameron McInnes is going to be my captain because he is playing 80 minutes. He's playing really sharp. One of the things, one of the, the main reason why I didn't captain him in the first place was purely because we weren't sure if Jai Field, or in this case Kurt, um, Kurt Mann was actually going to be stealing minutes off him. But, you know, he's going to be playing there. He's going to be doing a great job for us up in the middle. And he's, he's getting up there with the Cameron Smiths. You know, he's the first... No, he's number one at the moment in terms of all of fantasy. So again, I wouldn't trade a gun for a gun because you've bought them in for a reason. And that's why. And every time you make a trade like that, you end up getting caught with something silly. Question number eight from Random is, guys worth keeping their eyes on like Whitehead and Jesse Bromwich after they drop more cash? How good is that? Whitehead has finally been named in the second row after doing two abysmal games in the, uh, in the center. He ended up scoring two in the last round and 18 in the first round. Break even is 92. That's woeful. So, he'll probably score around 50. In fact, that's what uh, the fantasy stats are telling us. He's going to score around 50 because that's what he averaged about last year, if not a little bit more. And he's going to go down in value. And, of course, this is a game of buying someone at their lowest, a gun at their lowest, but selling a cashier at their highest. So, who am I going to look at selling and buying? Frankie Winnerstein. Now, Frankie could possibly peak next round if he gets 20, which means he'll go to about, you know, 200k, which would be really nice because I actually have 100, 181k up my sleeve. Remember, I started first round with 115k up my sleeve and then I basically downgraded Hayne to, um, to Tyrone Roberts Davis and I'm going to be trading out Idris for uh, Abby, which is considerably, you know, drain more money back in. So if, if uh, Winnerstein hits, you know, 200K, which we think he is going to be able to do, I could try that next round because 181 plus 200K is 381. We know Whitehead is going to drop another 20 to 30K. Unless he does an absolutely amazing job and ends up getting like 90 points and squaring off even, which we can't see, he's going to be going down. When is the best time to buy him? When the break even is about level or lower than what the projection is for a gun. So as soon as that break even gets to about 50, 
that's the best time to pick him up. You've bought him at the best possible price, which might not be the next game. It might be the round after. That's, again, circumstantial. So keep an eye out for Elliot Whitehead. The other one, of course, which, as you mentioned, is Kenny Bromwich's brother, Jesse Bromwich, is, um, you know, he hasn't made his return just yet. Same theory. Round three break-even is 80. Very unlikely he'll score 80. If he scores 60, his break-even will then become 60 for the next round, and he'll lose another 20, possibly 30K, which is a really good time to bring him into your team and buy him. Bang, get it done and dusted right there, and um, have yourself a great forward in amongst the pack that you've got now. And, uh, you know, one of the main things that you want to be picking up, Whitehead up for us was Canberra play in round 12. So look to trade in Whitehead, not this round, maybe not the next, but the round after that, considering how he goes you know, in, this, in the second row. But he's going to be a gun. He's going to be a gun in that position. We know he loves to offload. We know he breaks the line quite, you know, quite significantly. And he's probably going to be nipping at the heels of wanting to play in the second row again and making a bit of a statement to hold his spot. So that's, uh, that's the consideration. Let's also touch base on one other center that I wanted to talk about who necessarily wasn't a center but played center is Carl Lawton. How good did he look at playing hooker? He scored 44 points of 33 minutes. He ended up getting injured, being pulled off the, t oh, um, being pulled off the uh, field. But a hooker who's a center in fantasy is absolutely amazing. If Carl Lawton ends up getting plucked into the team as starting hooker, I'm immediately going to look at how to trade him in. I might trade him in as a straight flush for Inglis, and that will mean that I probably can't play him inside the squad. In fact, I'd have to probably sub out Kelly and also pull in Carl Lawton. Now, the reason why I want to do that is because, again, I don't like to play centers and wingers and fullbacks. The less I can play of them, much like the Bryce Cartwright theory, is if I can play a second row in my halves, that means I have one less half to worry about, and that's an inconsistency, inconsistency that I don't like to uh, contend with. So Carl Lawton played absolutely amazing. The other thing you have to consider there is on the late mail news, how close is Nathan Peets to coming in as well? It might be worth just brushing up on that. It could be the round after, but considering that you could have a center score as a hooker, and we know he's probably going to be good for at least 30, possibly 40, at 152K is going to be up there. I just couldn't believe the fact that he ended up scoring 44 points of 33 minutes just by a positional move. He was a freak. He's a speed machine. He broke the line. Ended up picking up a really scrub ball from Ash Taylor. Made the most of it. Got through by his acceleration alone. So he's another one to keep a bit of a close eye on. Unfortunately, I think just purely the fact that he was injured in the last round, have they named him on the extended bench? But, you know, keep a close eye that he might get the last minute flick in. He is going to be playing, you know, Friday night, so you should know early on if you have to bring him in or not. <laughs> One of the questions I got from Sai was, could you also answer something else in the next video, mate? Sauce in the fridge or in the pantry? Let's go check it out. Now let's go find if my sauce is actually in the fridge or in the pantry. Let me know in the comment section below what you guys do, because that's one of the biggest debates, I guess, of this particular video, of all the other questions I've got so far. So, in my fridge, I have tomato sauce, Dijon, and there should be barbecue, there we go. So I put the barbecue, tomato, and Dijon sauce in the fridge, but, and a big but, because as you can see in my cupboard, we have a different type of sauce, which is the Byron Bay chili sauce, and I highly recommend Byron Bay chili sauce. We're not sponsored by it, but maybe if this video gets enough hits on Twitter and likes on YouTube, we can actually get sponsored by Byron Bay chili sauce. It is the best chili sauce that you can possibly buy, and I highly recommend trying some. And the reason why I store it there is because the haters are gonna hate. Another question I got was from Pacey's Best, which was about Mitchell Pierce. He said, uh, what if you've lost all faith in a particular gun that you started with and he's talking about Mitchell Pierce directly. He's been extremely disappointed in the first two rounds. And now that I've seen how the combination works between him and Luke Keery, I cannot see him as a 50 to 60 point gun anymore. You know what? That is a very good case where I don't see him as a 50 to 60 point gun anymore. Because you know, one thing that you'll see is when he started last round from round nine all the way through to round 26, when he did play, is that his lowest score was actually 40. And he scored that on two occasions. Everything else was in the 50s or 60s. And he was doing that consistently, and he was getting much higher points, doing quite consistently well. 
The odd thing is, is that he had the same kick meter average. If anything, he had lower kick meters than what he did in the last game. He kicked 373 meters on an average last season. And if you see in this last game, where is he? We're going to have to scroll down for this guy, aren't we? We're going to have to keep scrolling down. He kicked 333, 383 meters, which he's the dominant kicker. One of the questions I always ask myself when I'm picking my halves, if I am picking a genuine half and not a second rower as a half like Bryce Cartwright in that exception, is two considerations. Is he the converter? Is he like kicking points? Is he getting two points for every conversion or every penalty that they kick? Because that's quite a solid base stat to have. Look at Jared Croker, for example, who kicked about you know 93%, ended up getting 188 fantasy points two seasons, seasons ago, purely based on kicks. And the second point is, are they the main kicker in the team? Mitchell Pierce is the main kicker in the team, which means he's getting all the kick meters. Luke Curie kicked 117 meters, which isn't that much. If you combine the two, you get to 500 meters for the entire game. But the reality is, the option of Luke Curie to kick is going to be there sometimes when Mitchell Pierce is going to be kicking. The main thing is, he ended up scoring more kick meters than he than he did average in the last season, yet he scored lower points. Where is it? He got five missed tackles. Guess what? He also scored 63 in one round where he got five missed tackles last time. He has zero attacking stats. And one thing that you'll notice, and you probably noticed this as, as, as much as I did when you watched the uh, Roosters play, he's coming into that first receiver position where Dummy Half spreading out to first receive, receive Mitchell Pierce. Mitchell Pierce is then putting on to Luke Keary as the second support. And then Luke Keary is then gobbling up all the try assists like he got here. He got three try assists and two line breaks because he's the guy who's actually feeding the ball in the short ball, the inside outside ball to the guys. Whereas before it was just Mitchell Pierce because, you know, Hastings was there. They also had Watson to fill in at some stage, but Pierce was the guy doing everything. And when you've got a guy doing everything, he's just gobbling up all the points. So if you add the fact that there's three, you know, try assists and two line break assists, there's an extra, you know, 10, 12, 15, 16 points there that you could have been garnishing from that but you're not. And that's just because of the way that that team structure has worked. And it seems to be working for the team. I mean, they've won their last two games. They beat the Bulldogs, although the Bulldogs started to come back in that sec at the end of the second half. But they conven they convincingly beaten the uh, Gold Coast Titans, and Kiri looked like a mastermind. So Kiri looked great, but his base stats... look. They said defensively he looked worrying, but he had lower missed tackles. He, of course, he made less, you know, less tackles to begin with, twelve compared to twenty-two. But he, he wasn't getting the kick meters. If Luke Keary was getting the kick meters that Mitchell Pierce was getting in that, in that, the way that they were working their rotation, I would definitely be picking up Luke Keary. But they're split. Their two job duties don't add up to one major guy. And that's just the same. That's the same as Parramatta at the moment. Corey Norman is doing all the kick meters, but he's also the guy who's getting that second, sometimes being the first receiver and then spreading out to Gutho, depending upon which side they're rolling on. But some, most of the time, it's just Norman making his own way, getting the line break assist because he's been able to break through or even taking a run. So I, I, I do actually agree with you that he might be a possible trade. Who would you look at trading him to? Well, you could trade him to the same guy I have, is which is, of course, Bryce Cartwright. If you are willing to take a risk with how he's going to be playing with all the social media attention, remember he's downvalued at 433k. At the same time, Corey Norman's also there, but Corey Norman, the re main reason why I picked him is because I knew with Gutherson, he's going to be doing everything. He's going to be doing a much more of him. If Corey Norman doesn't play... I reckon the Eels are going to struggle, and I think they're going to struggle this week. So that's one thing to consider as well. You, the other toss-ups are Milford. Milford now is converting. He's now converting kicks, which means he's getting those extra points when the Broncos score. And the Broncos, think about it. If the Broncos get a penalty in the first 5, 10, 15 minutes, and it's 0-0 score, they're always kicking for two points. Milford will get those two points. Kehu was doing the kicking juries, but it looks like Milford's now taking it off him. I don't know if that's because Kehu was injured in the foot. It just seemed that he naturally just took over that spot. And if that's going to continue, Milford's also great to have because he's also got the bye coverage playing in round 12. Double thumbs up. 
The other choice is the Adam Reynolds trade I was talking about earlier. But the problem with Adam Reynolds, amongst all things, is that he simply is expandable. Like, he's breakable. He's, 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 he's a troubled half to have in your team if he is going to be breaking down. And when your halves are really thin and you got, you're forced to be playing players like Kane Elgie instead of a main gun, that's a worry. So I'm going to be sticking with Bryce Cartwright and Norman for that reason. And quite possibly one of my favorite segments of this is looking at the first top ranked guy. And if we can catch him, what are his weaknesses? Is he catchable? Let's have a quick look at that. We're only in round two. Guys, remember, when you're playing fantasy, anything can happen. By scoring one really good round, as you can see in round one for me, it jumped me up so high that I had about round two and I'm still in the running. Many of you guys in the top 20,000 are still in the running. It's just about making sure that you make the right trades you make the right facts. And, and and when you're making your trades, look at it this way. State what you think about the particular trade. Then split that away from what do you know about the trade? What do you know about the player that you're bringing in? A Cohen S is a great example there because you're looking at the, the fact of, is he worth bringing in? What's he going to be able to do for my team? Am I looking at him from a cash perspective? Am I looking at him from a perspective that he's going to be playing those longer minutes? So... Consider those things when making it. But let's have a look. Bash of the Titans is first. Remember, Mundine Forever was round one, rank one. And now we've got Bash of the Titans, who's just leapfrogged him by... How many points is he up by? He's 1,761 by 20 points, so not that many. Let's have a look. He's, he's uh, hookers. Cameron Smith, Jaden Braley can't fold him. Braley seems to be the guy that everyone's taking a huge punt on, 46%. And you're really lucky to have had him because he's gone up by 46k, which is significantly more than what Casey Pritchard has done. He's also scoring a lot higher, and he also started on a lower basement price. The only thing I'm worried about is Seguiara being called up in the next week and being plucked from the team, and that's the only reason why I didn't pull him in. Just all the noise about hearing it and you know getting it processed through the NRL as an official player is one more you know cog in the wheel, but. If Jaden Braley plays those four to five games and scores those 37, you know, 38 points consistently, he's going to be, you know, milked to the brim. Joshy Maguire is a great front roll to have. Corbin Sims is a bit of a surprise package there. Has it gone up? He's gone up by 5K. So he's a mid ranger scoring, mid ranger scores. He hasn't gone up, he hasn't gone down. Jared Wallace. Again, Jared Wallace, we spoke about that earlier. The fact that he's scoring so well with all these injuries, I think it's a facade. And I think it's going to catch a lot of people out. If once he's peaked, I'm, I'm, you know, my advice to people would be look to trade him out for a gun because he's quickly going to be going back down to where he belongs. Herman Essesi. I'm going to be pronouncing that name so incorrectly that it's not even funny. But he's got a benchy second row. And the reason why I don't like benchy rookie second rowers is, do you remember when Jared Wallace played on the bench for the Broncos? He used to get zero game time. There was like seven to eight games in a row where Wayne Bennett had him as the 17th man, Jared Wallace, that is, and just played him for zero minutes. He's kind of weird in that reflect in that way that he wants to play guys for six, you know, 16 plays in a rotation rather than have that extra fresh set of legs in there. So... He trusted his 16 men to be able to do that. We, you know, obviously Herman Hesse is getting a lot more game time, but I just don't like that factor about it. He has scored quite well, at least for one round, 49, and then he got 15 in a row, round before. Not that it mattered because he's using him purely as a cashy. In fact, he has a he has quite a few odd cashies. Kurt Catewell scored 29. He did that from the centers, so that was a bit of an up, you know upbringing Tim I would do as much as I possibly can to minimize the amount of centers in my team but he's gone with having Kurt Catewell in the centers and that's probably because Kurt Catewell was named in the centers retrospectively Tom Malolo has done an amazing job from Hess he's going to be relying on Hess we've touched base on that Cordner has been you know he had what did he go he went 35 and then 62 so he's typical gun status played well in the last round not so much in the first round Curtis Sirinan, which quite a you know few of you have gone out there, twenty one percent. Pengai Junior, up there as well, doing another good job for Brisbane. He must be a Brisbane Broncos fan. He seems to have a lot of second front rollers based on that team. Sean Johnson as a captain, I don't like to captain my halves, you know, considerably that they might go in and out. 
Anthony Milford was one of the halves that I was considering bringing my team to start because he has great buy coverage. He now also converts and kicks goals. So if I didn't have Bryce Cartwright, it was actually going to be Anthony Milford. So that was a bit of a shocker not to have him. Lachlan Croker is not playing at all. I don't even know why he's in there. Ben Hampton, James Roberts, Moga, some more Brisbane players. So I guess when Brisbane loses and doesn't do that good of a job, his team's going to suffer quite significantly. Tommy Trevojevic, Nick Kotrick, Sully. He's got Justin Hunt, who's never going to play in first grade, possibly again. Peter Hiku, who's out. Idris and Curtis Scott, who also didn't play. So here's a bit of a strategy for those guys in the last you know, five to six rounds when you're looking at finalizing your team. What you can do is you can get rid of all your guys who have made money. So for example, let's say if Nick Kotrick ended up getting to $200,000, you would sell him for a non-playing player at 138 and, you know, get that 62,000 so you can spend it on upgrading to a gun somewhere. The whole idea there is, is that you've got a non-playing, uh, an NPR, a non-playing round for that player. Is that how it's... You've got, a, you've got a player whose score isn't going to be an auto-emergency. So if an Anthony Milford pulled out the minute before the game and your auto-emergency score went to Nick Kotrick, who might get five as a winger, that's really bad. But if you end up trading for someone who's scoring nothing, that's not a bad thing to... Um, to also have because that's what you want to be able to do at the end of the year that's going to be around round 15 16 17 18 that's a, that's a much longer chat and that's probably for 10 15 videos down the track doing that now is absolutely nuts having justin hunt scott croker tells me that this guy isn't as strong as a fantasy coach and he, him getting rank one is purely because he's a, a broncos fan when the broncos are doing well which they've done in the first two games, they're up against the Storm next game, so maybe not, but they've scored well for him at the moment, so I'm actually going to say that his team is going to struggle moving into it, because he's not going to be able to upgrade guns when he needs it, so that's going to be a bit of a plight for him to contend with, so he's definitely going to be catchable, in fact, if you're sitting back in like 15,000th position, you can catch this guy in probably four to five games when you're Cashies start converting into much better players or you're able to get one more gun in there when he's not able to do that. This strategy only works if your cashies become guns and everyone's trading to them anyway, but we know that these guys aren't going to be guns because they're not starting. That's not good news for him. So that's a wrap up for our round. I'm considering our team to be much better for the next round. Of course, captaining the more consistent Cameron McInnes, playing the hooker for 80 minutes. Bringing in our boy Tyron Roberts Davis, who's got that little bit of a hiccup there with his uh, break even at the moment. And I really suggest that everyone jumps on that because I've never seen that in all my years of fantasy. Unless there was that, you know, that one time we had the um, the second plate tier after five rounds when people could they couldn't know the second plate tier when people could no longer trade in their teams last minute or their players because there was a bit of a glitch. But that's the first time I've ever seen anything like that. So the other move I'm going to be doing is uh, bringing in... Who am I going to be bringing in? Carl Lawton last minute for Idris, if he actually gets named in the 17. Or I'm going to be bringing in Brad Abbey to play. Now, there's also Abbey and Montoya, because one plays on the wing, one plays as fullback. But the thing you've got to remember there is fullbacks generally score better than wingers, and we don't know much about either other than what we've seen on tribute videos. So I'm going to be picking up Abbey instead of Montoya there. There's also other players you can consider, like Joseph Marner, who's filling in for uh, Blake Ferguson. I, Again, much like the Dylan Edwards conversation, I don't really suggest to do that because I think a lot of people are going to get trapped by that. Slater is the same situation. He's very low valued at the moment at 211k. But here's the thing, mate. He could be injured in the next game. You're better off watching him for three games than making a bit of a determination if you should bother jumping on that bandwagon because, you know, a guy who came back and played one or two games and got injured and then had to delay his start is obviously a worrying sign for everyone. But those are going to be my trades, if anything. Again, don't get too impatient. You know, make sure you're milking your guy, your cashies for as much as they possibly can, even though they're a little bit slower. If you do jump on someone who's a little bit fast, like a Cohen Hess, and then they end up backflipping on you after two rounds, 
that's not going to be good for you guys. And that's not going to be good for me. So I highly, um, highly suggest avoiding that as best you possibly can. To finish it off, guys, please be sure to subscribe. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Give it a like. And I'll be checking out you guys next week because I do these videos every Wednesday. Be sure to ask me your questions, any ideas that you have. Feel free to ask me anything. Could even be through my Snapchat, which is at SpotTheOzzy as well. So you can ask me a Snapchat question. I'll put it on my video. You can ask me via the forums, the Facebook groups, whatever I'm in, whatever you see me posting. I'm happy to answer anything and maybe even make it in my video. So thanks again, guys, and I'll check you guys out shortly.